I'll just get into a screenshot. Thank you. Right, I'll just uh, thank you first of all for the opportunity. Uh, it is the second time I've um, I've made this presentation, so uh, it is a little bit uh, emotional. I'll tell you a little bit about myself first. Uh, Neil Mason, I uh, I took uh, the steps away from a corporate model about seven years ago and decided to start a company called Vitruvius. Uh, we're a small engineering business here in New Zealand. Uh, Kiwi Rail is one of our biggest customers. We do lots of work in the design and development of um, and delivery of projects. Um, myself, I'm a chartered engineer, and um, about five years ago, uh, Janine Benson, who's the South Island uh, general manager, she said to me, I've got a job just for you, Neil. Uh, you're very familiar with Otira Tunnel. Uh, we need to clean it. And um, at that time, it was quite dismissive. Uh, it was quite straightforward. I knew the tunnel very well. I'd been involved with the infrastructure strategy for the, for the tunnel uh, in terms of what we knew we needed to do. Um, and the only way I can really describe the journey is uh, if at any time I do have a little breakdown and start crying, Sometimes it's because of despair, but mostly it's because of relief. Um, I was quoted once of saying it couldn't have been any harder unless we were blindfolded. Uh, we started out on a journey which we thought was a very, very straightforward process engineering uh, delivery. And uh, three years later, we started to realize what we've got ourselves into. And I will say the determination of the team, uh, including Kiwi Rail and all of our stakeholders, uh, we absolutely really had to come up with some very interesting innovation in order to uh, realize the end of, uh, of the first stage of cleaning the tunnel. So I'm going to run through a slide presentation. Uh, like I said, if you don't mind, I'll keep questions until the end. Uh, and uh, yeah, we'll just, I'll, I'll see what I can um, do in terms of keeping you entertained. Can you move the slide on for me, please, for the first one? So I'll kind of position myself here so that I can point on this uh, map here, but you guys should all be able to see the slideshow at the same time. So uh, for those of you that you aren't aware, uh, the Otira Tunnel, just over eight and a half kilometers long, right in the middle of South Island, goes right underneath the Southern Alps. Um, it starts at Arthur's Pass, uh, 117 kilometers uh, due west of Christchurch, and is almost perfectly straight. Uh, we actually surveyed the tunnel. We're using laser technology and we confirmed that there is no more than a 19 millimeter uh, deviation in alignment from the, from the true uh, direction that was set out when it was built. So a phenomenal piece of, of engineering. Um, originally knocked through in the 1920s. And for those of you that aren't aware, originally the tunnel was, um, was electric in terms of using the, the, the power systems to get up the hill. So you've got this perfectly beautiful straight tube, which comes down at a pretty aggressive grade of 1 in 33, and uh, it's in one of the most remote locations in New Zealand. Uh, on a day like today, where Wellington's feeling a bit of a chilly breeze, the weather in Arthur's Pass is likely to be distracting, to say the least. Uh, average temperatures when you're working in the tunnel, normal temperatures would be between minus 2 and minus 6, and on a cold day, you're getting down well into the minus 12, minus 16 range. So it is a really, really cold an exposed area. It was, of course, a huge revelation for uh, South Island and the West Coast connectivity because until the tunnel was there, uh, everything had to go around by pack horse. So uh, it was a fundamental uh, moment in, in uh, joining the east and west sides of the South Island communities and the industries together. Again, if you're not aware, just further to the west, uh, those areas uh, like Hokitika and um, during the gold rush period, uh, was the sixth fastest growing city in the world. Uh, these places were absolutely booming uh, in terms of the Industrial Revolution. So, um, I've got to pause now on technology because my clicker doesn't work. Let me just try and reset that. Right. No, we did a trial on that. I'll just give you a wave when I want. So, if I could have a slide, please. So just to give you a bit of background, uh, going through the history of the tunnel, it was around 1988 to 1991 that the decision was made to take electricity power out of the Otira Tunnel. Slide, please. Um, that led to diesel, and there's a hundred reasons as to why uh, that decision was made, but we won't go into that now. But the 
travel here was uh, predominantly driven around ferrying West Coast coal to the East Coast ports. So it was a very, very good and thriving business. Um, the difference, of course, is, is um, diesel actually needs to burn quite a high efficiency in order for it to be an effective source of fuel. And the more coal wagons that the rail business put on, the more energy that was needed in order to get up the grade. That's common sense, please. Uh, and of course, the more locomotives that were needed, uh, then the more oxygen was needed. And you can see where this is leading to. Please. So as the trains, as the coal trains come into Oterra at the bottom of the tunnel, they, uh, they have to add locomotive power in order to get up the hill. Now the hill is straight, so that's about as good as it can get in terms of resistance. But you still have this challenge of six locomotives pulling between 28 or 30 uh, coal wagons and just absolutely consuming all of the oxygen in the, in the tunnel. And the more oxygen, of course, they consume, the less power they have. So it becomes less and less efficient. The more locomotives you put on, the actual worse performance that you get. Next slide, please. So there's our oxygen running in through our tube, please. Uh, what was done, of course, was uh, a fan house was built at the end of the tunnel. Uh, and what that allowed to do was to close the door and actually draw oxygen in to the tunnel. So then you're pulling oxygen down the tube and onto the locomotives that are consuming it as a part of a more efficient burn. Please. Now, the challenge with that, of course, is as the locomotive is uh, filling the majority of the space in the cross-sectional area of the tunnel, the fumes that are still coming out of the exhaust, please, and again, and again, they fill the area above the vehicle. And it makes common sense that as you're pulling down huge volumes of air and then you cram it through the narrow space over the top of the, lo lo the locomotive and over the top of the wagons, please, it accelerates. So as the air goes over the top of the loco, it actually gets up to about 126 kilometers an hour. Now, that's okay for the driver. He's sitting in the warm with the heater on. And that's okay for the locomotives because there's no impact. But of course, you've got uh, 28 coal wagons behind. And I'm not going to get into the discussion around why aren't the coal wagons covered, etc., etc. I can explain that. But the point being is, for 30 years, the wind's been going over the top of the coal wagons at 126 kilometers an hour. So unsurprisingly, anything which was small or light or very, very small particle size uh, got drawn off the wagons. Next slide, please. So um, you've got this trapped kind of situation now where the wind needs to go faster to, to feed the locomotives, but the more wind you have, the more impact you have, and the deposition of particles throughout the tunnel increases. So what were the results? Over 30 years, there is a buildup, or there was a buildup. I need to remember to talk in past tense. There's a buildup of material uh, on the tunnel wall. Now, uh, it's difficult to put it in context, but generally we had areas which were up to 75, 100 millimeters deep of finite particle uh, coal buildup on the walls of the tunnel. Slide, please. And it's on the floor. Now, this is a good picture because what you can see here is the tops of the rail, and that's normal ballasted track. So you can work out there, you've got roughly 120 millimeters of, of finite coal cover. Now, when we looked at the actual material, we needed to know what we were working with. It became apparent very quickly that it wasn't just coal. And one of the things we realized is that with six banker locos running up the hill, they were struggling for traction, and they were consuming about 70 cubes of sand a year in order to just get friction on the railhead. Now, no one really worked out where, of course, that sand was going. But what it was doing was it was getting crushed down and crushed down and again becoming like a finite particle. And with the wind speed down the sides of the train, it was also getting aerated again and getting plastered all over the walls and the, and the underside of all of the, the structure. So uh, when we actually got in and looked at what we thought was uh, just a cleaning program, we suddenly realized that we actually had a very, very difficult material here to shift because in a finite scenario like that, anything which you try and use mechanical means, which might cause aeration and you end up with a very finite particle, there's a risk that you could actually induce an explosive environment. So lots and lots of assessments were done in terms of, well, how flammable is this stuff? 
Now, I'm pleased to say that we proved that it wasn't very flammable at all, and we had every confidence that the tunnel was safe and that we continue to use mechani mechanicalized uh, methodology in order, to, in order to tackle it, because as you can see from the pictures, there's a huge volume of material here. Please. Um, I can't show you that one because that slide won't run, unfortunately. But to give you an idea, um, we did some uh, tests. Will it move on, please? And uh, what we needed to go back and was just uh, discuss with our sponsors, well, can we be really clear about what we're actually going to achieve here? Because as usual, expectations run very, very high. And we needed to keep our feet on the ground and say, well, at the end of this project, there's every likelihood that we're going to have the same tunnel with the same asset, with the same level of performance, only a huge dent in our pocket regarding the amount of money that was spent. So we needed to be quite clear. So we revisited the project objectives and we uh, just determined with our sponsors, please, we wanted to get rid of all of the coal dust and the sand. And like I said at the beginning, originally everyone thought it was just about coal. We needed to make sure that at the end of the project, we actually came up with an asset which could be maintained and um, inspected better because all of that coal just obscured every uh, inspection from actually being able to determine what the true condition of the asset really was. Uh, and we obviously wanted to offer a safer environment. And when we talk about safer environment, I got to spend a lot of time with the track maintenance and the asset management teams who were uh, responsible for maintaining Oterra. And talk about a guy, you know, guys who were really up against it. Every time they wanted to do any maintenance, the first thing they had to do was they had to dig out the coal. So before they even started doing something in there, they had this huge task ahead of them, which was removing this contaminant from um, from them being able to get on with things like track maintenance. And and I will come to it, but one of the things the communication guy said to me was, "You just can't believe what it's like. As soon as we want to touch a cable, we have to clean the coal off first. And there were piles and piles of contaminant material stacked on top of all of the uh, signals cables and the, and the um, communications cables. So it's a horrible environment for everybody to work in. Please. So uh, we went through our smart objective setting and we thought we better check A. Is this project achievable? Now, the Kiva Rail um, Investment Group had put some money behind us and said, you know, it's a very well known objective. And we were managing our stakeholders, including um, people in WorkSafe, because obviously they were very interested in, in handling things like hazardous materials uh, in tunnels, because obviously tunnels is a very dangerous environment. So we did some tests on A. So A, is this actually achievable? And that's where we started to really uncover how difficult this project was going to be, because we all thought at the beginning that we were just going to dig all this coal out and we were just going to move it and get rid of it. And yeah, we would do some sluicing or we would do some washing and it would be pretty straightforward. So first of all, the first thing we wanted to test off the back of some uh, advice we got from the mining industry was would this material sluice? Can we get it to suspend in water? It makes common sense when you think about it. We've got a one in 33 grade. We've got a beautiful drain all the way down the tunnel. If we put water in the drain and we put coal in the water, then we can get it to carry the material out for us and we don't have to have any mechanicalized plant to try and uh, double handle or treble handle the contaminant. So we did some tests about how we could sluice it, please. We also did some tests uh, with how difficult it was going to be to get the material off the surface of the structure. And again, we looked at the different combinations. So we looked at high pressure, high volume, low pressure, low volume, different combinations, different distances, number of heads, number of people. And I remember after the first test, and we only tested for an hour, the guys came out in order to do a full debrief. And please don't underestimate that we had really good safety controls in place. But the guys came out after the first brief, and straight away we said, right, we're not doing that anymore. Because they went in orange, and they came out black. <laughs> And that was one of those first moments where you think to yourself, oh, hang on a moment, we've got another 8.6 kilometers of this to do. There's no way that we can have uh, people, human intervention involved in the cleaning process. So it all had to be completely automated. But uh, the philosophy behind using water was still robust. So we were still doing really well in terms of the main way we're going to convey this material out of this huge tube is to put it in water. Please. So, uh, <laughs> moving on to the first, or I would say the second major hazard, 
when we talked to the mining industry, we said this is what we've got to do. They were very, very casual. Uh, they said, obviously, with Greymouth being where it is, and it's a big mining community, they said to us, yeah, it's easy. It will definitely, you'll definitely be able to suspend it. There's absolutely no doubt whatsoever. All you need is enough capacity to hold about 4 million litres a day, and uh, you need about three weeks to allow it to self-separate. And even with a few coagulants and uh, stabilizers, you'll be able to just bring that out, put it in a big pond, and um, uh, and it'll be a piece of cake. And you can just pump your clean water off, and then you can you can dredge your your contaminant out. We're like, okay, that's not as quite as easy as you think, because when I show you the site, we're building um, the out the output of this uh, water treatment plant is on the edge of a river in a rail corridor uh, across a bridge which is 60 meters long, at the foothills of a mountain in a consent conditions national park where no one wants anything to do with any kind of contaminant actually touching the natural environment. So you're starting to see there's a few trip ups here. And the first thing that we found out with our consent condition requirements, of course, was the number of stakeholders. Everybody from DOC to the environment of Canterbury to West Coast, Ewe, everybody had an opinion on the fact that we don't care what you do with the coal as long as you don't put it in our back garden. And there's that natural reaction from an engineer to say, well, it came out of the ground, so we'll put it back in the ground, eh? and we'll just like dig a nice big hole, and we'll bury it, and we'll cover it, and everything like that. And everybody was like, no, that's definitely not going to happen. So uh, move on, please. So the first thing that we needed to work out was, well, what's clean water? So TSS, which is the total suspended solids, uh, we anticipated on behalf of the Kiwi Rail team, we anticipated that uh, we were going to be up at around 150. So 150 temporary suspended um, solids, that's the kind of water that you would see uh, flowing out via, um, through through the Canterbury Plains. You see that in a natural water course. So we thought 150 was okay. So when the Environment Canterbury came back to us and said, no, no, it'll be 25 parts, we kind of struggled with that a little bit. And to give you an idea of how clean is 25 parts, I have no doubt at all, you, you, you'd comfortably drink a glass of water with 25 parts in it. So you're talking about a, cu a cubic metre of, uh, of water which has got 25 parts of contaminant in it. And bearing in mind, of course, the contaminant is a very, very small particle. Although you can detect it, it, it isn't going to cause you huge amounts of problem. So 25 parts per million kind of dropped us back a little bit in terms of what we needed to do. But they also said that uh, ideally, Kiwi Rail and the consenting agencies agreed that because of the life and expectancy of the tunnel, they wanted an operation which could be maintained for 35 years. So we've suddenly gone from a project which is cleaning a tunnel to maintaining a system which has got 35 year life. So you, that's a step change overnight. Please. Uh, the other thing that caught us, which uh, was very, very difficult to come to terms with, is that because we were taking water from one side of the mountain and putting it on the other side of the mountain, we needed two consenting authorities to agree that the water was suitable to convey from one side to the other. And all of the ecology that went with that and all of the environmental effects would went with that. When you start the project, you think to yourself, well, I'm just going to draw it out of the Beely, Arthur's Pass, where there's plenty of water, there's no shortage there for sure. I'm just going to put it in the drain and I'm going to pump it down. And then suddenly you realise that actually, yeah, that's not a done thing. People don't generally get permission to pump water from one part of a mountain range to the other. And we were talking about some serious volumes. So we were talking about about 160 litres a second that we needed to draw in order to get the right ratios uh, for our dilution. So this is a picture of something which, again, whether we were naive or, um, or not is yet to be proven. This is the fish screen which went on one of the intake pumps. Now, we had planned uh, with our engineers that we would have a very, very simple filter system. And they said, well, that's fine uh, unless you're actually in the Beely. And our environmentalists and the ecologists were very clear with us that you had to have a filter screen which could roll and move so that if at any time a fish did get stuck to the side of it, it would roll over and get dislodged and fall off again. So, so these are about 100 grand a piece by the time you get it designed and built and fabricated. And it has a complete self-cleaning system and it has a complete automated system. And, um, and again, yeah, that's really, really uh, quite a complicated bit of kit. Then you work with the uh, dock uh, stakeholders uh, and they're really 
clear that Arthur's Pass is a very picturesque place, so they don't want to be able to see that. And then you get to the working with the tourism guys, and they say, yeah, well, we have a lot of through traffic for tourism at the weekends, so when you have to go into the river to dig the hole each week to put that in, because you're not allowed to leave it in, uh, we don't want to see the excavators in the riverbed at the weekends. So if you could please go in and do that late on a Friday afternoon uh, and do it without anybody noticing, every week when the river flows were of a level where we could take water, but not too high that it actually disrupted the rolling gravels in the riverbed to the point where it damaged the 100 grand asset, uh, yeah, that'd be fine. And you're starting to think to yourself, yeah, this is actually getting a little bit testing. So we couldn't take water if the river level was of a certain reduction because obviously we weren't allowed to pump that volume of water over the hill. And if the volumes got up too high, the rolling gravels and aggregates damaged the filter. So again, there's all this balance on go, no go in a place where we could have, we had to do that two days early before the day we actually needed it every week. Slide, please. So the, that was one element of the design process. I'll just run through this if I can. So basically, uh, we're pulling water out of the Beely River. And again, this comes down to our possession block of line management because everyone's traveled there to do a, a day's work. We only got two working blocks guaranteed per weekend. And so the straight away, you've got to double everything because obviously if one breaks down, the entire weekend is lost because you're miles from anywhere. You can't get any spare parts. So the entire system had to be duplicated. So everything that needed a pump had two pumps. Uh, our plan, of course, is to bring water into the tunnel. There would be some mechanical means in the tunnel which sprayed and diluted the, the coal dust, bringing it down from the walls, getting it across the floor and into the drains. And then when we get it down at the other end of the tunnel, nearly nine kilometers away, we had to get it across the um, Bridge 50, which is a really complex bridge for any number of engineering reasons, in a pipe that had to accommodate the temperature changes in Oterra, which uh, again put us in some very challenging uh, material uh, requirements. Um, slide please. And again, thank you. And then really once you actually get um, the black water into our system, we then got a whole process plant by which as the water goes down the pipe, we need to add exactly the right amount of flocculant based on the density of the water as it's going past at a speed of about 160 liters a second because there is no holding capacity on the riverbank. So we're dealing with 2 million liters of water a day in line. And then we're gonna pump it into a bag which will keep all the coal in the bag and let all the water out of the bag. Brilliant. When we explained this to the mining industry, they said, oh, it can't be done. No one's ever done that. And we really had to work, and I'm really delighted because uh, the contractors involved with uh, JV Rail, which is the joint venture, um, they brought in a company called Southwater, who are a local specialist in dredging and um, particle separation in water. And we had the WSP Opus team as well, who were really fundamental in terms of the process design and uh, bringing in specialists, including Waikato University, to help us uh, kind of come up with this uh, design, which was not only um, robust, but it was also uh, mitigated enough to the point where we were confident that the emulsion flocculants that were needed in order to hit the particles and catch them on time didn't actually become a pollutant itself because if you over flocculant you actually risk killing all the fish through uh, having too much mix and too much material going out into the waste. So in theory it was complicated, in reality it was massively complicated because there's the sheer volume. Slide please. And this is the picture that kind of explained it to everybody. This is one of the, uh, the original pictures that was put up as the philosophy support. Now that is a, uh, a geo bag and that's got black water running into it. Uh, the timing of the flocculant is such that it can make all of the tiny particles stick together and just make them slightly bigger particles. And the slightly bigger particles can't get out of the wall of the bag, but the water can. And this was the first time we saw that, and that's where we said, yeah, we've got something here which is really efficient in terms of space and time. Slide, please. So 
The final challenge, of course, which we needed to get DOC and um, the Environment Agency on board with was how do you get the water then back into the river uh, real time. And what we were very fortunate with on the Oterra side of the mountain is, is the, the rock is really fractured. So we built a huge pond and then the water was able to filtrate down through extra layers of membrane and actually go out back into the natural water course uh, through the rock. Please. So, a bit of a difficult picture to see, but basically the green line at the top here is uh, the pipe coming out of the tunnel and carrying that water, that water load across the bridge and then into the underground system. I'll show you some more pictures in, in a moment, but in, in essence it then goes into a, a couple of big plunge containers which uh, really are the first opportunity for all that sand drop out, because even though it's small particles, sand will drop out straight away. So they're basically two big buried 20-foot containers which have all been reinforced and they allow us a bit of capacity in order to uh, get rid of some of the, um, the, the solids straight away. It then goes across into a longer uh, tank which is called our balance tank and that's the first time that the chemists get the opportunity to get a bit of a uniform reading on how much or what their densities of black water is because that's where it's pumped out and it goes across then, and that's where the flocculant is added before it drives it down onto these big platform areas just here in the bottom right-hand side. And that's where we've got our bag platforms, which this whole area was engineered on the side of a river bank next to a river, which is all shifting material. So basically the desire line of the river is exactly where the hell it wants to go. It's got no say as to how you control that. So to defend that, we also had to build huge flood defences along the river bank. Slide, please. So that is a picture where it's nearly built in terms of the physical civil engineering works that we had to build. Um, so on the left-hand side next to the river there, you can just see the defense. Now that defense was uh, only a 24-hour defense. Gives you an idea of what the river is capable of shifting in that area. And for those of you that haven't been to Oterra, to give you an idea of the environment, in Wellington, you probably get between a meter and 1.3 meters of rainfall a year. Auckland, maybe 1.2 metres a year. Um, in Oterra, you get between 5.5 and, and 6 on a normal year. Um, they peak at uh, between 8 and 9 metres of rain a year. So uh, to tell the construction team that they've just got to crack on with it is quite hard. Uh, what's really interesting is the guys never underestimate a South Islander from the West Coast because when we were putting in the, um, the flocculent tanks and the mixing centres, I met a young lad there who was an electrician, and I swear we were standing there ready to go and get on the plane and just go anywhere other than Oterra, and he had stubbies and a t-shirt and was wiring up uh, with, with bare hands in the middle of winter, and I said to him, you know, have you got anything wrong with you that I need to know about? And he just said, you need to harden up and just get on with it. And that, those West Coast boys, I tell you, they were phenomenal uh, contractors in terms of being able to deliver the project for us. They were really good. There's a company called Inline over there, and they, the guys just never gave up. They were really determined to get it built for us. So you can see the bags laid out there, uninflated. This is just as we're getting ready. And you can see that. That's a 20-ton excavator in the bottom corner of the um, screen. That gives you a bit of idea of a scale as to the infiltration pond, which is the final kind of settling area for anything which did get through the system before it actually went back to the river. Move on, please. So there's an aerial of um, the fish screen on the intake at Beely. And again, what you can see there is the depth of the hole, the nice blue water, which we had to dig out every, every Friday morning before the tourism came through. Um, and that would be lowered down into the water. And I said we were pulling out with two big pumps, we're pulling out about 100 to um, 120 litres a second if we needed to. Now, there's always a bit of over design, but what we found is the actual optimum volumes that we needed to run at in order to balance the, um, the dilution ratios in the tunnel was only about 50, uh, 50 to 70 litres a second, which is surprisingly significantly less but of course we still had everything geared up if we needed it move on please uh, back one please so uh, here are the these are the first ballast tanks so the water comes into the low at the lower end of our screen here and um, like I said these two first tanks are just to get sand out 
uh, and we would fill those up over a weekend very, very easily, uh, just with two uh, six and a half sh hour shifts of cleaning. They would go through weirs, and then the longer tank that you can see at the top of the picture is the balance tank, and that gives us much, much more volume with the sand out of the way, and the guys were able to do an assessment of, um, of what kind of levels of flocculant, flocculant. And the flocculant is an emulsion, and you need tiny amounts for what we're talking about here. Even though we're talking about really, really heavy, dense black water, you only need tiny amounts, um, and it's all computer controlled. So the computer control unit that was uh, being used in order to do the dosing we're talking about just shy of half a million dollars worth of technology. So again, if I go back to the original brief that we had at the beginning, where we said got to, we've just got to clean the tunnel, uh, we're in a different place now. You know, this is this is the point of being space technology in terms of what we actually need in order to achieve this as an inline filtration system. Please. So again, like I said to you before, these are the uptake pumps here, the big blue ones. And again, you couldn't just have one; you have to have two just in case we needed redundancy, because if you've got nine kilometers of black water coming and the guys at the treatment plant say, oh, pump's broken down, can you just hold that water back for me for a little bit? Uh, basically, you've got black water coming for 45 minutes, whether you like it or not, and it's coming at 100 liters a second. So we had a whole mitigation plan, and over on the right-hand side of the bottom picture there, that's where the old infiltration ponds used to be, and we had a push-button emergency system where if we had to, we could just put all of that black water into a safe pond and we could protect the environment and the project and the plant and all the staff. Um, and again, that was just the level of mitigation which we had to have to make sure that the, uh, the environment agencies were all satisfied that we, um, that we had everything under control. The, uh, the pipe that you can see on Bridge 50 there, that white pipe, again, we had to, because of the temperature range in Oterra, we had to come up with a design which would allow for the expansion and contraction of a pipe. Everyone thought to start off with we just put a nice big PPE pipe up there or something, something very you know simple. Um, and then through the temperature range you realize that you've got uh, well over 600 millimeters of expansion and contraction through the season and uh, it's all obviously got to be protected against the forces from carrying that volume of water. So again very difficult in terms of coming up with something which would actually accommodate that range of growth through temperature expansion. Slide please. So uh, once we had everything outside the tunnel built, so we knew what to do with this, our contractor was busy uh, working and testing on things which were going to happen inside the tunnel. So the JV Rail team based out of here in Wellington were awarded the contract to clean. This is one of their first early test rigs on the left hand side here. Excuse me. <coughs> what we had there was generally something which um, would carry water and then disperse it through a high pressure jet system. Excuse me. Um, and uh, again, I'll explain why that wasn't such a great idea um, when we go on in a little bit. And then you can see the guys there who are in the tunnel just setting up the nozzles in order to do all of those uh, tests. And what we found, or what the contractor found, I should say, is um, whilst the tunnel's perfectly straight, the track isn't. So as you run down through long sections, the track does wander around a little bit. So as you set your fixed structure up to clean a perfect piece of tunnel, you only have to move on 120 meters as it's already either too far away or it's too close. So the contractor found out through pain of the Christmas 2017 block that we actually needed a head which was completely hydraulic adjustable real time and the guy who was operating it could see what his relationship was between the boom and the wall of the tunnel. Please. So by Christmas 2017, we were um, starting to get the mechan mechanicalized uh, activity in the tunnel uh, moving. Picture on the left is uh, again a test of uh, how difficult it's going to be to get the stubborn coal off the roof. And again, the things we were looking for in the roof, of course, were the hydrocarbons because we had to deal with those at the water treatment plant as well. We knew that the exhaust had been blowing in there for 30 years and that had plenty of material to contaminate. And there are 80 odd. Um, Refuges in the tunnel as well, which uh, all had to be cleaned. And these, are, you can imagine with the turbulence of the wind, these were just areas where there was massive fallout for dust. So we had a good uh, 150, 200, 300 millimeters of material in the bottom of these refuges. So this gives you an idea there by a good water blast uh, through the mechanical cleaning trucks, how we can get that back to the original um, condition. 
the other reason that we put this picture in is because you can see from the um, the photograph of the refuge that it's really inconsistent in terms of the concrete. Again, in the ideal world, when you start these projects, you think that you're going to clean it off and it's all nice and smooth concrete underneath. But what we found out is that there's a surprising amount of Friday afternoon work in this. So there's a lot of bony concrete and there's a lot of very loose concrete. And we had to work with the Key Royale engineering guys to say, well, well, what do we do if we come across a whole area and it's loose? And the Key Royale guys said, look, better to take it off and then deal with it knowing that it's stable than try and leave it on knowing that it's unstable. When you think about it, that's probably the best solution that we could come up with. So what we found was a lot of breakout of uh, localized areas where the concrete was particularly weak, um, but nothing actually uh, came down in terms of any significant um, structural surfacing or stuff that we actually had to repair, which was a good which was a good win. Slide, please. So here's just a couple of pictures from the kind of Sunday morning. The first picture on the left uh, is the sand being dug out after a single cleaning shift, uh, and again you can see that that's that really kind of just. Uh, coal stained traction sand which is used on the locomotives. The middle picture shows the black water going through the weir and that really gives you an idea of the emulsion style kind of black water that we've got with very very high density um, number of solids and to give you an idea when I told you we were aiming at a TSS of 25 we're receiving a, a incoming TSS of about 80,000 so uh, it really is a high density uh, mix and the, the little one on the right hand side there is the output. That's our output from the from the system. And that's what I said, it's really quite spectacular that that's being achieved in line at just over 100 litres a second. So very, very good outputs um, from the Christmas 2017 trial. We were delighted that we'd actually come up with something which fundamentally worked. Not that there was ever any doubt. Slide please. We then got on to the big uh, topic, really, which is where we put the pressure on the contractor because we said, you know, everybody's built the plant and the water's clean. We're ready to clean the tunnel. What have you got for us? And very quickly, the contractor diverted to high rail excavators towing tanks of water in order to be able to apply consistent pressure. Now, the problem is, is that the two machines in the picture here, they carry between five and six thousand litres of water. Now, they can draw that out of the drain, providing they're drawing out of an area which is clean. And they would get through that in about eight minutes. But it would take 15 minutes to fill them back up again. <laughs> so you can see here very quickly, we all realized the ratio of cleaning versus time in the tunnel was unbearable. And uh, we tried bigger pumps and you just spend your whole time running backwards and forwards in order to get to somewhere where the water is clean. Because everywhere you disturb it or everywhere you've already cleaned is running black water. So it became a logistics nightmare for us um, and whilst we managed to start getting some green squares up on the KPI report we did some sums and we worked out we were going to be there for I think about three and a half years and that just wasn't going to make anybody happy I don't think we're any, none of the crew were up for that and certainly the stakeholder and Kiba Rale as a client weren't up for that slide please so uh, there was a guy who came on board uh, called John O'Donoghue and he came on from Fort and Hogan at um, at Christchurch and the reason I specifically uh, make reference to John is because for me John is like the Messiah because he walked onto site fresh and he said this will never work and uh, you kind of needed that fresh in introduction of new uh, new ideas and he said the challenge we've got here is, is that we need to pick up water as we're moving and we need to pick up water at a phenomenal volume and he said, it's quite easy. We need to stop talking to mechanical engineers and we need to start talking to irrigation engineers. And what you can see here is the mobilization of the reel. Now that reel has got 450 meter range and they geared it perfectly so that whatever speed the high rail plant ran up and down the tunnel, the reel ran at the same speed. I'd like to think that was a civil engineer that managed to work that one out, but they assured me that was back with the mechanical engineers. But for the first time, you could see that they could draw as much water as is necessary out of the drain, but they could still run up and down the tunnel with their hearts content cleaning away um, at a steady pace. Slide, please. The truck that you can see here in the picture gives you an idea of the size of the pump that you need in order to keep up with that reel. So again, these are this is, this is really, really big and powerful gear. The illustration at the top gives you an idea of how the consist works in the tunnel. So the excavator is working on the downhill side. The truck is stationary. 
and he's just pulling water out of a known manhole with clean water coming on at 100 litres a second, as much as he can possibly take. And basically then, the reel and the excavator are allowed to run up and down. They can just keep running backwards and forwards to their heart's content as they like, just peeling the coal off the walls and bringing it down so that we can um, flush it off and into the drain in order to transit out the tunnel. This was a massive breakthrough, massive breakthrough, but it was still nearly June 2018 by the time we actually got this fully commissioned and in. From the time this was commissioned, it took us nine weeks to clean the tunnel. It was an absolute revelation. Slide, please. And that's why I pay particular reference to John O'Donoghue because I believe that to this day he's still the reason that I'm sane because it was very, very difficult and I just needed a new person to help. So there's a picture of the size of the spraying head on the arm of the excavator. It's quite difficult to capture a picture in the tunnel because you want it working with the lights on and everything. Um, but believe it or not, as soon as they get running, the moisture density in the air just made everything regarding um, photography very difficult. So we actually managed to, to clean 126 squares in one weekend. Um, we still had all of the challenges, which is regarding the weather, the remoteness, and the consistency of the, um, of the workload. Uh, the guys were uh, pretty stretched, to be fair. We had a core team of, uh, I'd say, eight to 10 people who were on the project throughout the three years that we were there. Uh, slide, please. Uh, and that gives, it gives you a couple of ideas of what we were tackling. So the picture on the right is uh, the before and after with the spray having been applied to the top half of the photograph and the existing surface on the bottom half. And the picture on the left is a beautiful one. That's actually the um, lining of the tunnel. And what you can see there is the black water running down the side of the wall, which is actually sluicing out from a section which is being cleaned just further up. So you can see that morale now is, is really starting to kick off because um, when we talk about squares, we divided the tunnel up into a clock face, sorry, a clock face, and uh, one square was 50 meters long. So in the early days, we were only we were working all weekend and only getting eight squares ticked off our KPI register. When we got it really cranking with the real working, we were getting up over 100 squares um, in a shift. It was just phenomenal. Slide, please. And there's a Sunday morning picture. Having worked all night, this is music in motion. So you've got an excavator digging out sand from one of the ballast uh, tanks. Uh, you can see the, the chemical guys over here from Southwater are, uh, are monitoring the balance tank as they're still receiving black water after a long night cleaning. You can see over on the far side, one of the, um, one of the bags is full, and that's obviously been charged overnight. And if you look carefully, you can see on the bottom right-hand side, the next bag has just been fired and that's actually just about to start filling up with black water. So that is a process in motion. That's absolutely beautiful. And that's why I keep referring to that picture because that's everything working as it should be. So we would fill one of these trucks up quite easily on a Saturday night with sand. And then the rest of it that's coming out is all coal. Slide, please. There's a bit of a progress report. So again, like I said, we diced the outside of the uh, tunnel into a clock face in order to be able to us record about progress. Green means it's all good. Yellow means it's had a clean, but the uh, Kiwi Rail uh, construction supervisors aren't completely happy with it. It maybe needs a little bit of a tickle in order to get some of the more stubborn coal off the wall. And red is the area where, well, you've been there, but we're not, we're not paying you. It's pretty, pretty straightforward in terms of the commercial uh, measure. Please. A couple of um, measures of performance. There's the two jars. One's water in and one's water out. Please. Um, again, the real methodology was a complete breakthrough for the project team. Uh, to go from frustration to success over a couple of weeks was just amazing. Uh, we had a total of 1,720 sections to clean, please. Uh, and we did actually kick off, yeah, 126 uh, sections. So just under 10% in, in just one weekend, just in two shifts. And we all reflect back now, and we have done over a beer to say, goodness me, Think how much easier it would have been if we'd have had that at the beginning. But hindsight's a wonderful thing. Slide, please. So to conclude, uh, please, we came up with a water treatment plant which had an inline system which had no holding capacity whatsoever. The project continued to process 2 million litres of water every day. Uh, we had TSS in of 80,000 parts per million 
and we had no environmental breaches, we had no failures, we had no prosecutions. We had um, regular visits by Environment and DOC, and they just applauded what they saw. It was absolutely phenomenal in terms of uh, the cleanliness of everything that went on and the success. We had uh, a few minor safety uh, incidents. Uh, we had a collision with a vehicle in the actual tunnel door, which was a very, very bizarre and unfortunate event. Um, but we had no other injuries or anything which was worth uh, reporting about. It was very, very uh, well delivered by uh, the team in terms of safety. Please. Uh, and there is a clean tunnel, which is uh, the real success. So when we go back to those real project objectives, uh, it's really interesting when you talk to the track inspector now, because he actually has to stop and look, and he can do his job thoroughly because he can see his asset for the first time in 30 years. And uh, there's been a bit of work. When we uncovered the floor, we changed 700 rail bed plates, which we found which were uh, either choked with material and weren't functioning properly, or they were cracked or they were defect. And we changed those real time as we went. So at no time did we open out any areas which were left unstable or unsafe. We fixed it all as we went. And that was quite a challenge to see the guys get in there with all battery, new battery operated equipment and get in there and actually get it done and get it built. It's a really good effort, please. Uh, it's a safer environment. The finite particles have all been removed and a lot of people say to me, well, you know, how are we dealing with the build up again? Well, the truth of the matter is the water treatment plant is there. If there is a build up, we can apply our knowledge and we can clean the tunnel again. There's a different project which is going on, which is dealing with the coal at source. And that's not really my responsibility. As we sit here today, we could remobilize if we needed to, and we could probably start cleaning again in less than eight weeks. So we have a, a system whereby we can maintain our environment rather than let it deteriorate again. Please. Uh, and we've got a passive uh, water facility there at the moment. So the system at the moment doesn't need manning. It, uh, it can intercept uh, large particles, ballast and sand. It does that in a, in, a, in a passive way as it works at the moment. And at any time, if we need to turn on the flocculent dosing system again, we can do that. It's all there for us in order to re-employ. I always thank everybody who was involved in the Oterra Tunnel project. I've gone through this presentation without breaking into tears and falling down into a bubbling mess. There were days when we thought that we were going to lose, but we didn't. And uh, one of the things I will say is the camaraderie between the guys that worked on that job is something which I think will be maintained for a long time. Uh, it's an amazing environment to work. It's incredibly aggressive, and I'm really pleased. And thank you for the opportunity to, um, to just present on it again. I enjoyed it. Yeah. Thank you. And sorry that my clicker didn't work. We did a, te we did a test on it, and, and, and unfortunately, just one of those distractions. Uh, well, thank you, Neil. Um, so it's great seeing the second time round. It, it, it reminded me how, how, how much was involved in this project that I'd, I'd forgotten half of what you'd done last time. So it's really great to see it again. Um, we have questions now, um, both from on the floor here. If, if you can um, um, say who you are and what your question is, and also um, in terms of questions from post on the chat panel. So if you're if you're on the webinar, you can post questions on the on the chat panel and we'll hopefully be able to read them and um, answer them there. So well let's see anybody got any questions from the floor in Wellington to start with? Are we all so blown away by it? The gentleman over there. Uh, Liam um, you said you were using about seventy thousand litres a second going through the tunnels. How much of that was just washing by uh, so yeah, that's a great question. So uh, in terms of keeping the drain sluicing, I would say that we probably used um, anywhere above uh, 30 litres a second in terms of just keeping it going. And then, uh, so so that's where getting the balance was. If we, if we got up to an intake of 100 litres a second, it became a bit overwhelming. And we ended up, whilst we had a good product in terms of getting things moving quickly, so it was much more rapid, we didn't need anything like that. So you're inducing risk unnecessarily just by having really high volumes. So, so to summarise in your, in your question, I would say that we ran uh, an intake at the top of the drain of about 70 litres a second. And out of that, we're using about 50. 
and 20 are going by and just keeping the sluicing process running. Could you just explain why you had the word only at the end? What, what, what did they miss out on the rest of the work? Uh, the trains. So we had to deliver the project with a zero impact uh, on Kiwa Rail services. So the Transalpine had to run continuously without us even uh, interrupting it. And coal trains and all of the regular freight traffic had to uh, be undisturbed. And some of them run Monday to Friday. They run non-stop. Non-stop. All the time. All the time. So the route is incredibly busy. And again, the tunnel is one of those beasts where you know it's one in, one out, that you never have more than one service in the section. So uh, the coal trains run on a pretty regular service and um, yeah, they're slotted between uh, the tourism services. Well, that's a good question. I don't know. I would think I would probably, there must be at least 20 trains a day, which would be 10 up and 10 back easily. Probably, possibly more, but yeah, I'm, I'm scratching the detail there. But there's no opportunity to get in to do any real work. You can get in and visit and inspect, but you can't get in and do any real work apart from that Saturday night and Sunday night uh, clear clear air period. Pat, you can just remind us what the sort of typical working conditions and temperature was when you were in there in the middle of the night. I, uh, I. <laughs> reminisce and I remember standing in there when we were having a successful day so things were going well and I remember thinking to myself um, the measure of this is I never want my children to be this cold um, it's like standing in it's like it is standing in a wind tunnel and someone just uh, blasting air temperature at you at about minus 11 degrees and there's no way you can go to get out of it you know you, you, you have all of the best intentions 10 layers of clothing, but of course you still need to move, you still need to do your job. So it's not a case of going down there and just being a barrel of, of, of thermal protection. Um, you need to move in order to stay alert. Remember we're working at night and, and those kind of environments are where hypothermia sets in. So we're continuously loading the guys and everybody in the tunnel with electrolytes to keep their, um, their balance up of, of what their body needs through that period. Um, and we didn't expose people. No one was ever uh, exposed uh, to, to conditions which were, you know, un, unnecessarily risky or dangerous. But you, you just have to, yeah, standing in Arthur's Pass uh, at three o'clock in the morning, when the outside temperature is already beyond um, what the state highway guys were allowed to to be um, to be used for running backwards and forwards. It was um, absolutely unbearable. And of course, the first thing we did in the tunnels we, was we introduced lots and lots of m mist and water, which allowed you then to get wet and cold. So these, these huge rubber suits and everything that the guys were all walking around in, yeah. Again, it's like everything else. You, you learn how to stay warm uh, and it becomes bearable, but never, um, never, never again. Yeah, 600 millimetres across the length of the actual bridge. Uh, 70 metre structure. Yeah, so we actually had to come up with a system whereby the, uh, the, um, the pipes could expand and contract with joints. Um, yeah, but again, we struggled with the loading because the density of the black water really gave us uh, high forces where we were actually trying to turn and steer the material away in order to get it off. Once we could get it underground, we knew that we were much, much more robust, but we still had to get it through the curve of the bridge. So it was just one of those physics equations. And again, uh, we, you know, we wanted to give Kiwi Rail a product which met a 25 year life. And in order to achieve that, there's very, very complex coatings on all that pipe work because of the UV is very, very exposed to UV in the Otero area as well. So we needed to make sure we didn't end up with something which ended up being brittle and fractured after only 10 years of service. Yeah, yeah. It's a huge temperature range there. I mean, in the summer it was absolutely gorgeous. It's a great place to go. It's just that rotten winter, unfortunately. Days like today, I'm sure it would be absolutely treacherous. So. Do we have any any more questions? Any questions from anyone no, online?
Question there. <laughs> not many I think like I say it was a real emotional journey we did all uh, go out for lunch and there was just I think there was just a lot of shock at the end of it all during the during the real successful cleaning period where everybody could everybody knew it was working uh, we, there was an accident unfortunately associated with a different project and there was a stand down period for two weeks and um, we were worried that the guys wouldn't come back but they did come back and the team morale on that weekend when we all came back was quite spectacular and i think that's where the emotion really proved that we had the solution and we knew we were going to there was going to be light at the end of the tunnel and that was amazing and that's why i think the team together actually I, i'm quite convinced now if you said to the crew we're going to go and clean the tunnel again because they know how to do it and they know that the system works i think we'd actually have uh yeah i would imagine five out of six volunteers so it was a really good team camaraderie Uh, I started, I was, I was asked to look at the project um, in September 2015 and we finished cleaning in uh, October the 14th, 2018. Lots of, lots of steps along the way. Yeah, lots of steps. Like I said, we, uh, we spent a lot of time at the beginning with the value engineering and working with the stakeholders, uh, just trying to get the consents alone. It cost, it cost Kira Rao uh, now on a million dollars to get the consents. And that was when we got a bit of pressure from some of our stakeholders as to why we hadn't started cleaning. We just had to explain to them. It's not actually quite as straightforward as you think. It's very, very, it's a very, very complex um, problem, but but solved now and and uh, yeah, solved forever. I'd like to think. Uh, there's been discussion around uh, have we put it up for some awards? We haven't yet. We we probably should. Absolutely. Certainly in the water treatment industry, that would be uh, probably well received. Cool. Okay. Well, um, if there's no no more questions from anywhere, um, just one thing I'd like to say before I say thanks. Thanks for oh, a fantastic good. presentation, good. Neil. We have recorded the webinar and we will be sending a link out to that recording to everybody who's like, is registered on the webinar who came here tonight. So. You'll be able to uh, do it, and, and I guess Neil, if anybody has any questions they want to ask, oh, I'm looking yeah, at sure. again. Yep. They, they can contact you if they yep. if they want. As to. long as they haven't got another tunnel, <laughs> <laughs> got another five like that for you to do something. So. And um, so, thank you to our uh, audience overseas. I hope you have found it good. I'm certainly be interested in any feedback from people who watched the webinar about the how how the quality of the webinar in terms of the the, the broadcast and. Uh, how, well, how well that went. Um, and for those people who are in Wellington, um, we have some refreshments next door courtesy of Vitruvius. So uh, please let, join me once again in thank, thanking Neil for his time. Thank you. Thank you.